Chapter 80 of Women in History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, July 2012. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter 80. Mrs. Grant. Born 1755. Died 1838. Professor Craig. The late excellent Mrs. Grant of Lagan, as she used to be designated to the end of her long life, from the parish of Invernessshire, of which her husband had been clergyman, and with which her first publications were connected, affords another remarkable example, both of the successful cultivation of literature by a woman in trying or unusual circumstances, and of the attainment thereby of many worldly, in addition to higher, advantages. She has herself told us the story of her early life and her first struggles, in an unfinished memoir which has been published since her death. In the mere acquisition of knowledge she had no peculiar difficulties to encounter, either from circumstances or any deficiency in herself. On the contrary, her faculties were quick and early developed, and her opportunities, though not affording her a regular education, were well suited to nourish and strengthen those tendencies and powers which chiefly gave her mind its distinctive character. I began to live, she observes, to the purposes of feeling, observation, and recollection much earlier than children usually do. I was not acute, I was not sagacious, but I had an active imagination and uncommon powers of memory. I had no companion, no one fondled or caressed me, far less did any one take the trouble of amusing me. I did not, till I was six years of age, possess a single toy. A child with less activity of mind would have become torpid under the same circumstances. Yet whatever of purity of thought, originality of character, and premature thirst for knowledge distinguished me from other children of my age was, I am persuaded, very much owing to these privations. Never was a human being less improved in the sense in which that expression is generally understood, but never was one less spoiled by indulgence or more carefully preserved from every species of mental contagion. The result of the peculiar circumstances in which I was placed had the effect of making me a kind of anomaly very different from other people, and very little influenced by the motives, as well as very ignorant of the modes of thinking and acting prevalent in the world at large. It was this anomalous character in her case, happily free from any kind of grotesqueness or absurdity, and allied to everything virtuous and noble, that both directed her to literature and authorship in the first instance, and gave much of its interest to what she wrote. Annie McIver, Mrs. Grant's maiden name, the daughter of Duncan McIver, a plain, brave, pious man, having been taken by her parents to America, returned to Scotland, and married in 1779 Mr. Grant, a chaplain at Fort Augustus in Invernessshire. She acquired a taste for farming, led a life of fervid activity, and had a large family of children, all promising, and the greater number of them beautiful. It would have been strange indeed if her literary aspirations had sprung out of the domestic habits of the mother of a large family and the manager of a farm. But we are told by herself that she had begun to scrawl a kind of Miltonic verse when she was little more than nine years old. She had early written off many scraps of poetry and distributed them among her friends, who had taken care to preserve them, while Mrs. Grant had retained no copies. It was by a kind of amicable conspiracy that these friends set about the good work of collecting and publishing these pieces, in such a way as would secure pecuniary relief to the author. The subscriptions amounted to three thousand names, and the original poems, with some translations from the Gaelic, appeared in 1803. Some years afterwards came her Letters from the Mountains, which not only claimed the attention of the reading world, but inspired so much love and respect for the quiet virtues and literary abilities of the author, that many who knew her, and some who did not, contributed to help her in her hard struggle with the world. But Mrs. Grant's life was destined to be a passage through storm and sunshine. Her husband died, and her children, inheriting his tendency to decline, fell off one by one, so that every year brought her fresh trouble yet still with a noble spirit that enabled her to surmount her afflictions by something like philosophy. In 1811 she published her Essays on the Superstitions of the Highlands of Scotland, 
with translations from the Gaelic, in two volumes, and subsequently a poem entitled 1813, which excited little attention. Mrs. Grant's life, for some years after she gave up writing for the public, had been in part devoted to an intellectual employment of another kind, the superintendence of the education of a succession of young persons of her own sex who were sent to reside with her. From the year 1826, also, her means had been further increased by a pension of one hundred pounds, which was granted to her by George the Fourth, on a representation drawn up by Sir Walter Scott, and supported by Henry Mackenzie, Lord Jeffrey, and other distinguished persons among her friends in Edinburgh. During the period of nearly thirty years that she resided there, she was a principal figure in the best and most intellectual society of the Scottish metropolis, and to the last her literary celebrity made her an object of curiosity and attraction to strangers from all parts of the world. Even after the loss of the last of her daughters, her correspondence testifies that she still took a lively interest in everything that went on around her. With all its increasing infirmities, she says, and even with the accumulated sorrows of my peculiar lot, I do not find age so dark and unlovely as the Celtic bard seems to consider it. However imperfectly my labor has been performed, we may consider it nearly concluded, and even though my cup of sorrow has been brimful, the bitter ingredient of shame has not mingled with it. On all those who were near and dear to me, I can look back with approbation, and may tenderly cherish unspotted memories fond recollections, and the hopes that terminate not here. I feel myself certainly not landed, but in a harbour from whence I am not likely to be blown out by new tempests. Even after this, she was destined to receive another severe shock from the death in April 1837, in her twenty-eighth year, of her daughter-in-law, who had been married only three years, and to whom she was strongly attached. Still her courageous heart bore her up, and the zest with which she enjoyed intellectual pleasures continued almost as keen as ever. End of chapter 80